parents of Heron Pond students and Jock students. And um, we're going to start on time because we respect your time. And you've all rushed over here from 100 different places to be here on time and, and to learn about what are we going to do differently for our students for lockdowns. And this is Officer Rich Adonisio and Captain Pelletier and um, from the Milford Police Department. And we have just really developed a very, very strong partnership with our Milford Police Department. And they've been incredibly supportive in terms of training our teachers and our district staff around lockdown procedures. And the information that you're gonna to hear tonight, uh, the, the district staff has been fully trained on this information. And we've got a really well thought out plan for rolling out this information to students. Officer Rich has already been, I believe, at the high school levels and middle school levels, talking to grade levels of students, letting them know what, what things will and how things will look a little bit different going forward in our, in our response. And he's going to meet with our students. I think I'm gonna, we're going to organize a grade two and three conversation and a grade four and five conversation with students. That's going to happen on this Friday, October 4th. And then early on at some point next week, we will have our first drill. I will probably send an email, let you know before it happens in case people want to talk to their children about it, but they will have already been briefed um, by Officer Rich and we're just going to walk them through um, and, and support them with any changes that um, and any information that we want them to know and learn so that they feel comfortable. So I welcome you. And um, again, Officer Rich is here. He uh, developed handouts for you. So we'll leave these just right on the, the side table. So if there's something you want to take home, I'll also probably print off copies and send them home with students tomorrow because there are a lot of people who aren't able to be here. So thank you very much. Good evening. Thanks for coming. Um, so what I've done uh, over the past couple of years, it started with our, our prior superintendent looking to move the district forward and get more in line with, with industry standards across the nation as far as the schools and their emergency responses. Um, and our new superintendent has taken up that mantle and really helped me in a partnership of putting this together and actually, <clears throat> excuse me, getting it implemented in our school system this year. So this presentation tonight is the same presentation that I would give to any parents. Some of you may have, obviously you have children in the lower grades here and or, and or at Jocks, but you may even have older children um, in the other schools. The presentation, the information you'll get uh, generally is going to be the same across the board. It just, it's a description of what the system is and, and how it's going to look differently for our, our students. Um, and then once I've gone through, maybe a little bit as we go along, I'll kind of show you how it's tailored for the different age groups because obviously what you would do with somebody like this is different than what you do with somebody like this. Um, different expectations, different, different practical uh, implementation, but the basic system is the same. So, as I mentioned in this slide, this, the district has a strategic plan, and part of that strategic plan is to, uh, is to update our security measures and practices and policies to make them more in line with other districts across the nation. So, we have set goals to have everything implemented by 2022, so with this we're already ahead of the game for a change, which is nice. So, this system that, that we're implementing is called ELR. Um, like the military, law enforcement loves its acronyms, so you know, everything has to stand for something else. So ELR is simply Emergency Lockdown Response. It's short, sweet, to the point. There's an emergency in a building that requires a lockdown, and we have some sort of response. So it's pretty simple, a little more flexible than some of the other systems that, where their acronyms mean specific things along the line. Um, ours is intentionally open-ended because the system itself is generally open-ended. So it's a preferred method to respond to, the term of art is a, a violent critical incident or a VCI, because everyone's got school shooters and that's what captures the headlines, that's what everybody is assuming we're talking about. And, and of course it is, but it's not the only thing that this system encompasses. You could have any, you could have bomb threats, you could have suspicious packages, you could have just um, someone who maybe has come into the building on a prearranged meeting and then things just develop badly and a situation goes sideways and something that was supposed to happen becomes something that's not supposed to happen. That may be a, a situation that required the school to go into lockdown. So it encompasses all of these things and a reaction to it. 
So provides a series of options beyond the practice of the standard lockdown. If you want to think of the, you know, everybody understands what the what I can term as a standard lockdown, right? We shut out the lights, we lock the doors, we pull the shade, we move the kids to a, the safest corner of the room and keep them quiet. That's a standard lockdown. Um, as I said to the, the kids that I've been talking to, I don't need to focus a lot on that because you've been doing it for years just like the fire drills. You know that inside and out, no problem. Um, and it's, it's a response that still will be appropriate under certain circumstances. So we're not completely disregarding it. We're just moving beyond that being the only response to any kind of incident that might happen in our schools. So one of the things that it focuses on are the different kinds of abilities. Accountability, liability, survivability, and our ability. And that's where it starts to get tailored to the individual schools and grade levels. So for accountability, both you as parents, it's the same sort of thing in general, what you're concerned about and what we're concerned about as administrators, the superintendent, the police department, is knowing where all of our, our kids are when all is said and done. So you have that same concern. So we, we have plans for how to account for our students and, and where they are. Liability is something that anybody has to consider both on an individual level, i.e. the teachers who are actually in the room making these decisions, especially at the, the younger grade levels, as well as um, the police department, the school district itself. So this is, I left this in because this is, was, I feel this is important to understand that we're a very litigious society. Everybody has to be held responsible for whatever bad thing happened to you. Um, so the fact that there are lawsuits after these awful incidents that we see on TV, it's a fact of life. But across the board, every time that an individual has been found to have acted proactively in the interest of saving lives, those suits have been unsuccessful. So the important takeaway from that is that the, the legal system, the court system, recognizes that if, if you're acting in the best interest of the children, the decisions that you make to save lives, are, you, you, know, you can't be held unlawfully accountable for that because you are doing it in the best interest of the children. So it's, an, it's something to consider because we have teachers that we're entrusting our students with um, in all the spectrum of things on a daily basis and now in this topic under an emergency situation. And this is something that I don't need them thinking about when I'm asking them to make decisions, to, you know, to be adults in the room and make a decision. I don't need them worrying about, am I gonna get sued um, and lose everything for this. So this is something that's it's a little hard to, to, to look at, but it's important because most of us don't have any experience with, a lot of us don't have experience with firearms. Most of us don't have experience with war or any kind of thing where you're exposed on the wrong end of firearms. Um, so this is an important statistic that, that I gleaned from the various research and the various training I've had. That it's not like the movies at all where one shot and the bad guy goes through the plate glass window and never gets up again. It's not like that in reality. That 75% of all gunshot wounds are survivable. When we are talking about school shootings, it's important to, to understand this because if this is, you know, we all hope that this never happens, but should it happen, we need to understand that your odd, the odds of, are of living through it under the proactive circumstances are actually pretty good. People will be injured when this is thrust upon us, but you know, understand that it, it doesn't have to be the end game. So our ability, we customize both the implementation and the practice of the drills with our different grade levels. You know, what, for example, thinking of both ends of the spectrum, at the high school level, I've been telling all of my administrators to, to speak plain English. We're not doing codes, like a lot, anybody work at a hospital, a lot of hospitals use codes. You know, it's a code amber, code magenta, it's uh, you know, salmon, I don't know. But all of these things, they're not helpful. Especially if you're a guest coming into that school. Um, like in this school, we have a lot of parents that come in for lunch on a daily basis and sign in and sit down um, at, right in this room with their children. I don't need that parent not understanding some magical code or your code unicorn. I don't need that. What, what is that? Like, I want them to understand in plain English what it is. So at the high school level, I've instructed them, speak plain English. If you know that there's an active shooter in the building and they're, they're dressed all in black and they're currently in this location, you, that's the information that, that all of my people in the building need to be able to implement this system, which is options based. So again, this just mentions the proactive policies. This is basically, uh, if you like statistics and, and, and dates, 
These are all the different associations across the country who have recognized long ago, 2008, 2009, Department of Education in 2013, that just locking down in the, in the standard format is, is not enough of a response to the kind of world we live in today. We need to have more proactive options to, for the preservation of life of both of our staff and our, and our uh, students, of course. So the vast majority of these violent critical incidents, they're carried out by a current or a former student. You know, statistically, historically, that's the way, that's the way it, all, it has been. Um, a lot of people, one of the things they say is, well, if it's a current or former student, aren't we concerned about you know, these kids being run through and being, take, and be, being given the same training? that you're giving to our students and staff now. Isn't that a liability? Well, I would turn that question around on anyone who, who may be thinking it, that they've gotten the same standard training for years on basic lockdown, where that's the only option. The inherent plus of a, of a standard lockdown only methodology is that it's very simple to train people to do, much like a fire drill. It's repetitive, it never changes, and if you can make it mechanical so that everybody does it well. It's hard to screw that up, is what I'm getting at. That's, the, that's its inherent strength. Its inherent weakness is that anybody receiving that same training understands that a locked door is just an impediment to the people on the other side. So the premise being that if I go to a locked door, oh, well, shucks, I can't get in. I'll go to the next room. Oh, it's a locked door. Well, if you think about the bad actor in the building, they all know what a locked door means. They just need to get through the door. So that's the inherent weakness in standard lockdown only. The variability of the ELR system is actually its greatest strength. Because how can you, putting yourself in the mind of, of the, bad, the bad actor, how can you possibly guess what 45 or 50 teachers are going to do and decide on any given day? How could you plan for that, knowing who's going to be where and when and who will be behind what doors? It's impossible to map that out. And that's what we want, is we want that variability to, quite frankly, mess up their plans. So, during a violent critical incident, time is the absolute most valuable commodity in any of these situations. Unless I'm standing right in the building, and remember, I'm the only SRO, so I've got four schools, five buildings in this district that I have to go visit on any given day. If something happens here, and I'm up at the high school dealing with a situation up there, or talking to a student in the, in the guidance office or something, and something happens here, you're talking about Lights and sirens, it's still a good three minutes to get all the way over here and you know slide up sideways out front, don't listen to you, um, <laughs> and jump out and start dealing with the situation. So for those three minutes, the people that, that are inside this building are the ones that are essentially in charge at that moment. And everything that they do to buy me more time and all of my brothers and sisters in blue who are absolutely showing up. If one of these calls goes out, I guarantee you the cavalry's coming. They're coming from everywhere, not just Milford, every surrounding town. We will have support, but it's still gonna take time for it all to get here. So some of this, you mean one to seven minutes from beginning to end. The average, the average time from the, the moment the intruder first breaks in until in an active shooter situation, until the situation is resolved one way or another, is four and a half minutes. So if I'm telling you it's going to take me three minutes just to get here from the other side of town, that means there's, there's a minute, within a minute and a half it's going to resolve itself one way or another anyway. So the more, the, you know, the, the more time that we can buy, the more lives we can save. So the actual first responders in the building are actually the student, you know, they call us first, first responders, but it's actually the students and staff that are already there. They're the ones that actually have the first opportunity to respond to the situation that's occurring around them. All of this, though, doesn't matter without information. The ELR system is entirely based on, on the first alert, the information that's given. So if I, if I told you right now we were to have an intercom announcement and they simply said, well, what, we, what they will say, I have standardized this too across every school, they're gonna say the same message, so the kids will, again, the kids will hear the same message, the same alert over and over. Attention students and staff, initiate ELR. Attention students and staff, initiate ELR. It's also a little longer because nobody ever hears the intercom when the first thing goes off. Everybody's talking, doing, <laughs> teaching, whatever, and you're like, what, what was that? Did somebody say something? So we extended it a little to get their attention. 
The information that follows that second iteration is the important stuff. If all you got was, there's an intruder in the building, we're going into lockdown. All you can really do with that little bit of information is a standard lockdown because you don't know who it is, where it is, what it is, and where it's going. So with a limited amount of information, we will still be implementing a standard lockdown in a room, don't move because we can't really go anywhere, we don't know enough. It still stands for lockdown. So what's different about this kind of lockdown, one of the things is, yes, we may use a standard lockdown, but they can also use their common sense and senses. If you hear something out in the hallway after that announcement that may give you a clue as to what type of threat you're dealing with, you're allowed to take further actions. Whereas before, it was just lock that door, hope it's good and sturdy, move everybody to a safe place. Granted, we have a lot of cinder block in all of our buildings, which is awesome uh, as far as that goes, is resiliency. Um, but still, that's really all we gave them to do. Now we're going to introduce things like the possibility of using a barricade or other methods of hardening the doors to the classroom so we don't have to rely on just the lock maintaining that door's composure. Still, the content of the alert though, everything we do is predicated on what we hear. See, this is the, again, the intruder in the building, the school is in lockdown. <coughs> Is the one for the high school? Yes, so this, is, I, this example is for the high school. Hopefully we're basically familiar with how the high school works. You've got the big horseshoe and then there's like the ATC wing that comes off there with the wood shop and the welding and everything, just so that makes sense. So if the announcement came across, attention students and staff, initiate ELR. There's a person with a gun shooting in the area of the high school main lobby. They're currently heading down the hall past the gymnasium. Well, if you're over at student services on the other side of things, or you're out in that addendum of the ATC wing, why would you just shelter in place and lock down in that room? Why would you stay there? Wouldn't, wouldn't it make sense to get out of Dodge? If, especially like an ATC where they have all those doors and roll-ups and everything for easy access. Um, so, but prior, you know, we had the one standardized response. So now, with the ELR system, we can do a traditional lockdown. We can evacuate. One of the other things we can do, getting a little tricky here, is we can move through some of the internal passageways. A lot of these classrooms interconnect with, uh, because of fire code, non-lockable interior passage doors. So if we lock our main door, shove a desk against that, maybe tip a file cabinet over, in a real emergency, not during a drill, I promise I won't break anything. Um, <laughs> if we do, you know, barricade that door, secure it as best we can, and then we still are hearing noise coming towards us, we realize, wait a minute, this, this room, we can go through here, and then we can go through the next room down, and suddenly we're one classroom away from stepping outside in the hall and getting to a stairwell or an exterior door to get out of the building. So moving through these internal passageways is something that we're going to encourage the thought process of doing that. Of course, barricading the main doorway and the last ditch thing, the last ditch option, is preparing a counter. This far and away can be the most contentious thing, especially for your age group, for what do I mean by that? Um, Again, general information purposes. To counter does not mean to fight or actively seek out an engagement. Counter simply means to prepare yourself for the eventuality that someone that doesn't belong in your room is coming across that threshold. Given the option of just sitting there and doing nothing, hoping they go by, or empowering our students and our staff to take some of, the, some of their action, some of their power back and prepare themselves, Essentially giving kids a job. Okay, instead of sitting there upset, scared, worried, and whatnot, whenever you're focused on something else, you're given a task, it distracts you from all the, your free thoughts, all those things that develop all that anxiety. So I've been telling the kids, look around your rooms. Think about it every day. What kind of assets do you have in your room? If you're in an English room, are there a lot of large books, the things you don't ever want to actually touch or read? Are there are a lot of large, heavy books on a bookshelf, perhaps. Um, Maybe you're in a room that has a lot of random metal objects because you're in a graphic design room. There's a lot of tools around you know, for, that, you could, that are throwable, for lack of a better word. The idea being that if you have to respond to somebody coming into that room, doing something, again, is buying time. You don't want to let the intruder have all the time in the world. 
anything you do that's going to disrupt them and make them refocus, reacquire, um, reorient is going to extend the amount of time for the cavalry to get there to handle the situation. What we expect on an individual level, school to school, expect a lot more, don't expect a lot. A lot of the counter type stuff is exactly what Principal Alcock said. It's the training I gave the teachers and staff before school started. A lot of it's going to fall on them. They are truly the shepherd in this situation, and a lot of the action is going to be in, in, their, uh, in their court. Evacuation is always the preferred method of dealing with a deadly threat. Because if you're not there, you're in pretty good shape. So anytime that we can get away and get outside, away from it, whether that's by doors, by windows, we have a couple schools that have second floors, they have some unique challenges compared to like say the high school that's all one floor, every window is a good option. Um, but still, any means necessary to be outside and away from it is the preferred method. Internal movement, I talked about that. We can go back and forth between doors. Um, again, a locked barricaded door, then breached, but all the students removed three classrooms down. You just bought me a whole bunch more time in my response because now they've got an empty room that they spent time breaching and there's nobody there. So what does it look like? This is a slide I picked out from one of the presentations that I attended. Um, Barricading can look just like that. I don't think too many of our doors have huge windows like that, but there are a few that have the big side light on the, uh, next to a door. Most of our doors have windows in them, thus the shades. And uh, the shade is great for obscuring view, but again, we're relying on that lock not to fail or be breached. In this situation, whether that door opens in or opens out doesn't really matter because the doorway is now filled with junk that you, have, that you as the bad actor have to decide. Do I spend time trying to deal with this? Or do I truly move on because I don't have I don't have the soft target anymore? I can't even get through this. Um, so I've advised students to, and, and when I, the same as I did the teachers At, in the beginning of the year, I asked the teachers to look around their rooms as they're setting up for the year and make this a consideration for to best of their ability. Some rooms have a smart board; you can't move too many things around because the class has to orient towards that. But other objects, you can think about where can I put things to make them easily movable. And I told the kids, think about that. When you go to your next class after a presentation, sit down in your seat. Before you start talking to all your friends, before class starts, look around. Where are you seated in relation to that door? Number one. What things are around you that would be your assets in a bad situation? What things could I, could you enlist some of your classmates to help move? Um, what kind of things around, if I had to counter, what would I grab a hold of? What's the thing that I'm going to have, the tool that I'm going to have ready? The older kids, that's what we, I want them to start thinking about that because a lot of this training is free. It happens right here. They can be thinking about this stuff in the sense of preparing themselves because the last thing I want, either my students at the older levels or my staff, is to be making this up the day of. We always fall to our lowest, excuse me, we always fall to our highest level of training. We never rise to the expectations that we set for ourselves in our mind. So the more training they have, whether that be visualization on their own or being put through the drills um, throughout the year that we'll run them through, all of that is going to add up to making this more of a, a mechanized response, if you will. So again, countering is not the same as fight. We're not teaching him ninja skills. Nobody's going to come out of this learning how to ground and pound in the octagon. Um, we're really talking about just methods of disrupting a dangerous person's ability to inflict maximum harm. Because that's that ultimately that's what they're here for. That's their goal. Whatever their plan was, that's what they came into our buildings to do. And I want everything I can to screw up their plans. Um, it can be something as simple as I said this to. A group of sixth graders today in, the cafeteria, in their cafeteria had a whole table, it's 12 or 15 of them sitting around on a table. And I said, now granted, remember, they're sixth graders, so they're not much different than our fifth graders here as far as size, age, development. And most of them are about this big, and I'm not that big, and they're seated and I'm standing. So I said, guys, look at it this way. I'm not looking for any kind of special skills. If I were to lay down on the floor face down and all 12 of you got up and pick piled on me, I can guarantee you, I can't get up. If you lay on top of me, it's not a big skill to just flop on top of someone. They probably all do it on their own anyway. Half the time they're getting yelled at for doing it in class, right? So it's something they already know. It's an inherent skill. 
as a young kid. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. If, if it ever comes to that, we're not looking for any fancy dynamics. Um, it can be just as simple as tying somebody up and again, disrupting. Here's an example. You've got you know, a supervisor, you've got an adult there, these are some older kids, and they, so they've already done the counter, they've already thrown out every object they could at this person, disrupted them, knocked them down, disoriented them, and they're buying time until law enforcement can get there. So what ELR is not? It's not about security. Security is the kind of stuff that we've already set in place when we've had all our exterior doors locked, they're all uh, key pass operated, you all know when you come here during the school day, you have a buzz to be let in. Those are all the kind of security things that we put in place. The cameras that watch our hallways and whatnot, those are the kind of things that, that keep people out. But we're talking about what now situations. Our security has been breached. So what do we do with it after this point? And it's not a fighting or defensive tactics class. Here's a good stat for you. 84% of all violent critical incidents end by either the assertive actions of police or civilians or by the suicide of the suspect. Only 16% are resolved by no assertive action. And those are the few where they actually just leave, leave the building. There's so few where that happens. Generally speaking, somebody does something assertive to end that situation. I can tell you that our actions are going to be assertive when we get here, but we're going to have to buy some time until we do get there. So that's the end of the general information. Um, again, now kind of tailoring it for more towards our, our younger kids. I can't emphasize enough how much that when the kids are instructed in their drills, what, what I really hammer home with the younger grades, well all of them actually, but especially with the younger grades, is the importance of looking to the adult in the room for instruction. That's why I train the adults in the room first. And I actually put them all through the actual live drills. We spent a, a few hours the first couple of days of school where I actually put them in different rooms and I had them barricade, evacuate, and counter to a simulated threat. I had one of my guys come in, ski mask, Nerf gun in hand, and breach the room, break into the room. And you know, the people that were in that room got to counter. We ran the same scenario over and over, so the situation was the same, but where they were geographically in the school, Everybody except the people that counter, because obviously that had to be a controlled response for safety's sake, but all the other three rooms, they all got to make it up as they go. They got to interpret what they heard. We actually used the public address system. All of our, uh, all of our admins took a turn actually giving the announcement so they'd have the practice of doing it. Their people would have the practice of listening because we combined two schools at one building, two schools at another building. The rooms may be different, but it's still a classroom, so the functionality worked great. And it was really interesting to see what the grown-ups did. I did instruct them, I understand you're all chefs in this kitchen, but please play nice, don't argue with each other about who's in charge and who's going to do what, just pick something and execute it like you'd want your kids to do. And they did a great job of actually doing that. Um, and they, some rooms that I had uh, in my mind, imagining like what would they do, there was one particular room where they actually all did something different. They all were effective in, in getting their people out because it was an evacuator or barricade, but how they got out of that room was different every single time. And I thought that was great because that's exactly the kind of variability that I'm looking for. The result is positive and effective and everybody walks away from it, but the methodology doesn't have to be rigid and specific. Everybody was able to make their own decision. And in the counter room, the, everybody that worked in there, they did fantastic. I armed them all with glorious Nerf footballs and baseballs and they pelted the bejesus out of my guy. So they did a great job. They really got that concept home because who doesn't like to throw stuff when you don't get in trouble? Um, so where, uh, where it's different with the younger kids is really making sure that they focus on the adult in the room, giving them those instructions. I don't expect the kids to be making their own decisions. I expect the younger kids to be following instructions and then carrying through, helping to the best of their ability, focus on teamwork, because obviously a four drawer filing cabinet is a pretty heavy object when you're in third grade. But if you put six kids with the teacher's guidance on that filing cabinet, all of a sudden it's a movable object. It's a goal. It's something that they can do to, again, take some of that power back from an otherwise powerless situation um, and play a role in their own preservation. It's, it's both effective in the terms of actually saving lives, but also long-term in the sense of mental health. Because, you know, PTSD is a huge topic now. We know a lot more about it than we ever did. 
And it's a proven fact, I'll give you a bus example, um, bus crash example. During a large scale bus crash where there are many injuries, if you take someone who has a minor superficial cut and as a first responder, you see that person freaking out, locking up, getting that thousand yard stare, and you give them a job and you say, hey, what's your name? Bill, Bill, come here. I need you to come over here. I need you to hold this compress on this guy's arm right here. I need you to talk to him. I need you to keep him awake. You cannot let him fall asleep. I, this is really important. I need you to focus on this. Bill's recollection of that experience when he comes out of there and recounts this later is going to be entirely different than if he was told, no, just go stand over there. You're fine. I got to work over here. And he just was allowed to sit there and take it in and let his mind wander and formulate his own perceptions by giving him a task, by giving him a job and giving him some power back in a situation, it makes the mental health part of it so much better uh, in the long run. My end goal for all of these drills with the schools is to make it very much like the fire drills that we run our kids through nine times a year since you know they're knee high to a grasshopper. Kids don't think anything of fire drills, right? Does anybody come home and say that, oh my God, we had a fire drill today, it was awful. Does that ever happen? No. Because why? Because from the youngest ages, from kindergarten, we take them through and we show them that when the alarms go off and that awful noise and the flashing lights, this is what you do. You get up out of your desk, you leave your stuff, you line up at the door, you follow your teacher outside to a predetermined location, and you're safe. And you wait for the fire department to come and turn those awful sirens off. It's mechanical. They just go through it. I, I go to the fire drills and I watch the kids. They just go through it. They don't think about it. They're talking to themselves, talking to each other, having a good old time, just following instructions and doing it. These kind of drills, these practices that we can do, can be the same kind of machinations where we just drive home the basic physiological response. We put it back in the lizard brain, that fight or flight part of our brain that doesn't really do a lot of thinking. It just reacts to things. We put those little seeds in there so that if they're ever ever called upon to act in a real emergency situation, I don't want them to have to think about it. I want some of these elements to be mechanical. I want them to listen, to interpret what they hear, either make a decision when they're older for themselves or follow the instructions of, of, their, of their adult in their room, their teacher, their, their teacher's aide. A lot of times there's more than one adult in the room. And know that when they take these actions, they're going to be doing it, um, they're going to be doing it well and not have to think about it the day of. So one of the first drills that we're going to run, because I think it's the most important, is called evacuation to rally point. So this particular drill is very much like a fire drill in the sense that when, when we call out the drill, and it will be, as Principal Alcock said, it's going to, we're going to be hand-holding, hand if you will, um, walking them through it. I want them to understand the, the words, as I said, attention students and staff, initiate ELR. They need to get used to hearing that because they're going to hear it through all the way through graduation in the town of Milford. They'll get used to that, but then they're gonna to be told, this is a drill, follow the instructions of your teacher. Today's drill is evacuation to rally point, and they're gonna be walked right through that, told what that is, what that means, and it really is gonna seem like a fire drill to them with a little bit more walking, because the way it differs, Right now for a fire drill, they go, they exit out the doors, down the halls, out the exterior doors, go to their little locations, line up, and they get counted and checked off, and green card, red card for if I'm missing anybody, right? They, they're used to that, but they're still in view of the school. So if we're evacuating this building for an emergency that's in this school that calls for us to evacuate in a hurry, I don't want them anywhere near the school. I don't want them anywhere near a window, hallway, doorway, whatever. So that's the only difference is we're, they're gonna get out the same way, but then we're gonna take them to rally point because we need to show them that if, for example, they end, any kid of any age ends up outside the building by themselves for some reason, Maybe they're in the bathroom and they're coming out and all of a sudden this just sort of happens in a real situation, not a drill. Um, and they find, oh my God, what do I do? Oh yeah, I've been, I've been trained at this. I know what to do. I need to get out of here. And they get outside. I need them to know where to go. Because again, remember the slide about accountability? We still need to know where they are and be able to tick off the box that we got them and they're safe. To be able to tell you all that we got them and they're safe. So the only difference is at Heron Pond, for example, the rally point is going to be the same because of its geographic location. A lot of the other buildings have two rally points. Kind of think of it as the school being a basic box and coming from these two sides or these two sides and going in opposite directions away from the building. But where we are out here, we have some seasonal um, 
some seasonal things to deal with. Obviously, this place looks very different. This campus looks very different in the, in the winter, the three feet of snow, than it does right now. So we have some options that would be different um, in the nicer weather. They have a rally point. They can actually go out through the back playground there around the back of the baseball field. There's a, a power line trail that's, that's easily wide enough to drive like a side-by-side -side right through. And it does take you out to the back of a, a neighboring street that we could get buses in to transport them to another location. Not so much in the winter. Um, so the default location is always going to be out up the access road to where you all came in and took a left. That big field there, again, when it's nice weather, we can use the field, get everybody stationed out there. Even in the bad weather, the deepest, snowiest winter, the way down to the Brock's pit is always plowed clear because that's where the highway department gets material in and out of that location. So that's always clear. Um, so they'll always be able to group there. And that's sort of stage one. That's getting them out of the building to safety. And then the next stage after that would be moving them to a reunification site. That's another word that I would need you as parents to know because when you all call freaked out, wondering what's happening, what do I do, where do I go, I want my kid, don't come here. We don't want you coming here because remember what I said, a whole bunch of us are coming. We don't need more vehicles clogging things up and delaying anything, causing accidents. So where we're going to want you to go is to a reunification site, which for every school in, in Milford is the Hampshire Dome. We have a long-standing agreement with the owners of, of Hampshire Hills. We can use that massive balloon-shaped building, and we can put everybody in there. So buses will come, pick up our kids in the event of a real emergency with an evacuation, bring them over to the Hampshire Dome, where we will have an extra emergency services stage for any, any injuries to be able to get them to the next level of care. Um, we'll have extra police response will be directed there to help orchestrate things, and that's where our administrators will be able to kind of take people in and, and get that final tally of who do we have, who do we need to still look for, and then we would reunify them with you. So that's the first drill we're gonna be practicing with the kids up to the, the rally point part. We're not actually gonna bring the buses in because remember, we gotta get them back to class. This is gonna, I can't take too much of the time. I get in a lot of trouble when I suck up too much of the time for my drills. So that's the first thing we're gonna do. And then throughout the rest of the year, um, one of the new changes in state legislation is that the state of New Hampshire now mandates that we run out of all the drills that used to be mostly fire drills that every school has to do, we are now mandated to run four all hazard drills a year, one of which has to be an active shooter drill. By statute, it can be with or without students and staff, but we have to have four drills now. So from my perspective, I think that's fantastic because I think you can't drill enough and have too much training. So it's great because now I know I've got the support of my superintendent and my building administrators to change some of our drilling structures. So by the end of this school year, we will have taken the kids through a mock version of every one of the facets of ELR. So again, it's, the goal is working towards that sort of mechanation of it, getting it deep back there in that fight or flight part of their brain where they no longer have to think about it. And as I told the sixth graders, you know, by the time you graduate high school, you won't even be thinking about this stuff. It will, it will normalize the response. Why we have to respond like this is never gonna be normal. It should never be normal in anybody's mind, but we still have to deal with it because the alternative is to do nothing and just hope it doesn't come here. And hope is not a strategy. It's not a very good one anyway. So if we can train our kids and our staff to respond when an emergency situation arises, they're that much more likely to be successful. 